Uh, today I'm going to talk about some of our work to improve our pre-fusion stabilized uh, SARS-CoV-2 spikes and also a little bit on some uh, antibody isolation work that we did uh, collaboratively led by Laura Walker at Adamab. So I'll start with a little bit of background. Uh, some of these slides will be familiar to when I presented earlier this year, just to make sure everybody has the same background. Uh, this slide's important for one of the, uh, the later slides I'll talk about. And just noting that you know, the coronaviruses really are this large family of envelope RNA viruses with uh, four genera, the alpha, beta, gamma, and delta coronaviruses. Uh, the, the human coronaviruses are, there's two in the alpha coronaviruses and then more in the beta coronaviruses. So you have the two, uh, 229E and NL63, which cause generally the common cold, as well as HK1 and OC43. And then the more pathogenic beta coronaviruses, such as MERS-CoV, SARS-CoV-1, SARS-CoV-2. And so the, the beta coronaviruses are pretty diverse, these different lineages, A, B, C, and D. So far, we haven't had a human coronavirus that's in the lineage D, beta cov right? The, the spike will be what I'm talking about today, and that's obviously what decorates the, the surface of the virion. It's what led to the name. Right, so the, uh, back in the 1960s, when they were looking at this, uh, the infectious bronchitis virus and saw these fringes, they were called the solar corona. These were named the coronaviruses. Uh, the spike proteins are really important for both binding receptors and fusing the virus and cell membrane. And so I think obviously a lot of attention on, on binding to ACE2 and antibodies directed against the RBD, but the second function is also critical where the S2 subunit can rearrange and fuses the viral membrane with the host cell membrane, allowing the two envelopes to fuse and allowing the genomic contents of the virus to enter the cell. This is our model for uh, receptor-mediated triggering and fusion that was, uh, that was updated by uh, Daniel in my lab, one of the grad students. Uh, so we know from some of our previous work and others uh, in the field that the, the COVI spikes exist in this pre-fusion conformation, and they have three receptor binding domains because the protein is a trimer. And each one is in some sort of equilibrium, maybe flickering up and down. So there's an equilibrium where the RBDs are down, in capable of binding the receptor, and then the RBD can flip up. Its binding site to the receptor is accessible. Once bound, this should be somewhat irreversible, uh, depending on the off rate, but it keeps the RBD up. And then the second and third RBDs can flip up, be bound by the receptor. And then this is a really unstable state where the three RBDs are in the up position. They're not mediating interactions with each other. And then the S2 subunit then polymerizes through the center as the S1 subunits dissociate, possibly remain bound to ACE2. This forms the pre-hairpin intermediate that then refolds and rearranges to bring the N and C terminus of the S2 subunit in proximity of each other, which brings the viral and host cell membranes together and leads to the post-fusion state and the formation of a fusion pore that allows the, the viral genome to enter the cell. So our earlier work back in 2017, which was performed by my postdoc, Nian Shuang Wang, was to try and create mutations to help keep the S2 subunit in the pre-fusion state and not, not polymerize uh, into this really long alpha helical coiled coil. Right? And so this work was guided by uh, some of our previous work on RSV and others in the field for HIV envelope and influenza HA. And Nian Shuang designed two prolines in the in this helix loop helix region between the central helix and the first heptad repeat. Right, so this all goes into one long alpha helix. And so we wanted to keep it in this conformation. So the introduction of prolines actually worked pretty well for MERS. Right, so that when we tried to make wild type MERS ectodomain, we got very little protein. And then if we introduced single prolines at positions here, here, and here, we actually saw really nice increases in protein expression, which uh, based on our, our prior knowledge of class one fusion proteins, that tends to correlate with increased stability because the same amino acid sequence can encode for two different conformations, the pre-fusion and post-fusion. And the introduction of prolines helps favor folding into the pre-fusion conformation. And ultimately, we decided on uh, two proline substitutions at these two positions, which really boosted the amount of MERS ectodomain spike protein that, that we were making. 
And on gel filtration, it looked great. The MERS wild type protein, you could see a little peak, uh, but with the same volume of, of the MERS containing the two prolines, there was a tremendous amount of protein. This is some negative stain EM studies from Andrew Ward's lab, where the wild type active domain was this mixture of pre and post fusion forms, whereas with just the two prolines, it was a homogeneous population of pre fusion. And those same prolines worked really well for SARS and for other beta coronaviruses, like even HK1. Uh, for SARS, the wild type we could make more of in red, but then with the two prolines, we saw a lot more uh, protein being produced. The wild type, SARS-1, was this mixture of pre and post, but with the two prolines, it was primarily pre-fusion. And so we, we really like this. We were able to make a lot of different spikes and, and file some IP on this. And we thought this was a general method of stabilizing the, the beta coronaviruses. And so we were, we were primed and ready for when SARS-CoV-2 emerged and the sequence became available online. And Nian Chuang and, and Daniel in my lab were able to clone the gene, add in the two proline substitutions into the same region. And it worked OK. So we were able to express some protein, uh, but not very much. It was around 0.5 mg per liter. But the protein was reasonably well behaved if we moved quickly. And on gel filtration, the peak looked fine. And it was sufficient to obtain the first cryo-EM structure of the SARS-CoV-2 spike. And uh, we, we distributed the plasmid to many different groups and, and people worked with it with varying levels of success, but it, it wasn't the, the best protein, and we, we thought we could, we could do better. Having said that, the two proline version is in four of the five leading coronavirus vaccines. So Moderna's uh, 1273 mRNA, that includes the two P mutations at positions 986 and 987. Novavax's uh, subunit vaccine, the NVX CoV-2373, that also contains the two proline substitutions. Johnson & Johnson's ADD26 um, contains proline proline, or PP. Um, that looks really, really nice in the, the, the single immunization eliciting high new titers compared to the convalescent NHPs in humans. And also Pfizer and BioNTech, uh, they had four variants with two different inserts that they published on the RBD subunit one, but then ended up selecting the 162B2 variant for the phase three clinical trials, which contains the 2P mutated full spike protein. And so it was exciting to see uh, really wide adoption of, of the two proline uh, variants and that it's in for the five leading coronavirus vaccines. But as I mentioned, we, we ourselves had trouble working with the soluble ectodomain. Uh, we know others in the field were as well. And so we wanted to perform a second round of structure-based design using the cryolium structure that we determined back in February trying to see if we could improve upon the properties of the SARS-CoV-2 spike. So this was a collaboration with Ilya Finkelstein and Jennifer Maynard at UT. Back in March, when uh, the labs were being shut down that didn't work on COVID, they, they reached out to see if they could help us uh, with anything COVID related. I thought this would be great. We're gonna design a bunch of variants and test them. And this work was led by my postdoc, Chinglin She and grad student, Jory Goldsmith. Okay. So I mentioned, the S2P variant was okay, and we could get a little bit of protein, but only about 0.5 mg per liter in transient transfection of freestyle 293 cells. It also wasn't particularly stable and kind of tended to fall apart, um, especially when we were trying to complex with the antibodies and things. It, it was a little difficult to work with. So what we what we focused on then again was the was the S2 subunit. Right? So this is a different view of the SARS-CoV-2 spike. This S1 subunit, which contains the receptor binding domain and the N-terminal domain, which is where some of the neutralizing antibodies are directed. This is like a fusion suppressive cap that sits on top of the S2 fusion machinery and prevents it from triggering into this state. So it just kind of sits on there until the receptor binding causes it to dissociate. And then we get this refolding. So you have the central helix in blue. That stays roughly the same between pre and post. And then all these elements in the first heptad repeat in green, yellow, orange, red, all this goes to a really long alpha helix. And so our designs were to try and favor folding into the prefusion state and to disfavor the triggering and rearrangement into the pre hairpin intermediate or post fusion state. So our second generation spikes, uh, 
kind of contained, contained variants and variations that were focused in four different classes of the substitutions. So one was the introduction of prolines. And we and others uh, have shown that this can work really well for stabilizing proteins in general and class one fusion proteins in particular. Uh, the, the two main places to substitute the prolines are the cap helices, so that way you uh, remove the unpaired amide hydrogen and to stabilize potentially flexible loops with the proper phi psi angles. And so we, we introduced various prolines. We also introduced uh, substitutions to form salt bridges. So in this case, uh, it was originally a threonine at position 961. We replaced it with aspartate. That allowed it to form a salt bridge uh, with an arginine on a neighboring protomer. And another one is cavity filling mutations. Uh, normally, we thought that a lot of proteins are packed really well with a lack of internal cavities, and that keeps them well folded. But if that were true for these class one fusion proteins, they wouldn't be able to, to undergo this large conformational change. So they need to be metastable, and having these cavities is, is one way to keep them metastable. And so we try and substitute smaller residues for larger ones, like this leucine residue with the phenylalanine fits and doesn't clashes, better fills the cavity. And, and helps prevent rearrangement and exposure of the, the phenylalanine. And then also disulfide bonds, uh, trying to link regions that move or don't move, uh, or trying to add a cysteine to one region that moves and disulfide bonded to another region of the spike that doesn't move, but sort of covalently staple all of this moving machinery together. So we ended up designing over 100 variants, single variants, or single disulfide bonds, and testing them all. And we did 40 mil transient transfections in three cell, 293 cells, and purified all of them over uh, small scale uh, streptactin columns, looked by SDS page, quantified. This is some analysis. Of the 100 or so, about 75% kind of killed expression or either completely ablated it or substantially reduced it. Uh, so we were about one for four with a lot of our with a lot of our designs, and this is showing I think the 24 or so that either had a positive effect or not too detrimental of an effect. And so we're looking at expression from 40 mil cultures in micrograms per mil. The starting what we called our base construct was the S2P variant shown here. All of these substitutions were on top of the two prolines. Uh, and so the salt bridges actually perform pretty well. Uh, some of them increase expression threefold or 1.5 to twofold. And even the 1.5 to twofold increases can be really helpful uh, because they're often additive or synergistic. And so it's not bad to combine a couple of uh, substitutions that each had twofold increases in expression. Prolines work uh, really well as we were expecting with some of them having fourfold increases several in the two to three fold range. In general, the disulfide bonds really underperform compared to what we've seen with some of our previous efforts for RSV and human metanemovirus. Most of them ablated expression. Some uh, had no effect on expression, but maybe increased the melting temperature a little bit. Then we did have a couple that seemed to increase expression around two fold. And cavity filling mutations also worked pretty well. We had a number that uh, increased expression two to threefold. So it wasn't bad. So we had all of these single variants. And as I mentioned, for, for all of these, the first test was to look by SDS page. And so here's our S2P base construct. You can see that we're getting some nice expression. Um, the disulfide bond here is increasing expression. The uh, salt bridges here, the prolines, that one was, was really nice. And so all of these were then assessed by size exclusion chromatography. And we were mostly just trying to make sure that we weren't getting large aggregates, the protein was behaving well. The S2P variant is shown here in this dashed line, so relatively small. Um, the disulfide variants uh, didn't do too much. This one, that uh, this Q965C, S1003C, this one boosted expression on the gel and uh, by SEC, but shifted leftward. We think that the, the leftward shift is due to having more of the RBDs being exposed, resulting in a larger radius of gyration. And when we saw a more substantial leftward shift, often the particles didn't look great by negative STEAM-EM. 
Uh, and so for all of these variants, we passed them over SEC and then looked at them by negative stanium to make sure that we were seeing uh, uh, homogeneous populations of pre-fusion spikes. But the prolines, obviously, th th those look really quite good. S2Ps down here, and then we saw a range of increased expression, not really shifting or influencing the RBD dynamics. So at that point, then uh, we tested 100. We had 24 substitutions that we liked, and it was time to start combining them and trying to come up with a, a suitable combination. So we had some strategies. Uh, we couldn't perform all possible permutations of the different 24. We tried some strategies like combining all salt bridges, all prolines, all cavity filling, and then also more of a, a mix and match type strategy uh, to just try and make the, the Frankenstein spike that had the, the best variants of all of them. And uh, while we were doing the, the, the substitutions that were all similar, we noticed that the combining the prolines worked really well. Uh, so our two P variants here, uh, one proline is about the same. Combo 14 and 45 had two prolines. This had three prolines. And combo 47 had four additional prolines. And we saw nice increases by size exclusion chromatography. Uh, so we were getting around tenfold increases uh, for combo 47. By uh, differential scanning polarimetry, we saw a nice leftward shift, or sorry, rightward shift in the melting temperature. Uh, so the S2P had the TM around 45, 46 degrees. In combo 47, the first peak was shifted to around 50, 51 degrees. And it was nice by negative stanium, combo 47 was just this beautiful population of pre-fusion spikes. It was really easy to work with. And so since it contained four additional prolines plus the original two prolines, we called it hexapro, so we could remember. And uh, the protein expressed really well at large scale. Uh, so that was all done at, at 40 mil scale. When we went up to like leader scale expression in 293 uh, freestyle cells, some of our early efforts, we were getting like 11 mg per liter. We've now had some preps around 20 mg per liter. In XP Cho, uh, we've gotten up to uh, 32 mg per liter and, and even higher. By negative stain from, from both 293 and XP Cho, it's all nice pre-fusion spikes. Uh, as expected, the binding to ACE2 is an effect because we didn't, these mutations aren't anywhere near the receptor binding domain. So the S2P uh, the ACE2 with the KD of around 11 nanomolar, Hexapro 13 nanomolar. So that's identical within the, the error of the experiment. Uh, so not only were we excited to see that the increase in protein expression uh, was substantially uh, improved, but the protein was also more stable to work with. <clears throat> so this is looking at three saws. So the top row is S2P, and the bottom row is Hexapro. So both of them could survive a single freeze thaw, but if we did three freeze thaws, then S2P mostly had like disappeared from the grid. A lot of it was lost. What we could see was kind of this aggregated mess, whereas a lot of the Hexapro was retained, and what was left was still pre-fusion. We could also let the protein sit at room temperature for one day or for two days, and Hexapro looked fine. Because again, for S2P, we started seeing a lot of debris and some aggregates. So, so this was a lot easier to work with. Uh, we did some stress tests where we incubated the proteins for 30 minutes at increasing temperature. Hexapro was looking good uh, even at 55 degrees. At 60 degrees, it's a little hard to tell here, but some of the particles were no longer pre-fusion. Whereas with S2P, uh, it can handle 40 degrees Celsius, but at 50 degrees, we started seeing a lot of debris and it started breaking down. So Hexapro was, uh, had increased expression and it was more stable uh, to work with uh, biochemically. We next wanted to make sure that the introduction of the four prolines didn't have any deleterious effect on the protein structure. and We didn't make things non-native. Uh, so Daniel uh, quickly collected a cryolium data set on the Hexapro. Uh, this is a, uh, a C1 reconstruction, went to 3.2 angstroms. And overall, the protein looked identical to the original uh, S2P variant. So Hexapro is in green, S2P is in white. Uh, you know, the mutations are in, in this region here, which are basically superimposable. 
<clears throat> the prolines are all where we expected them to be. The density was really nice for them. So overall, the hexapro spike structure is nearly identical to S2P. And uh, another thing we wanted to confirm is that it would be useful possibly as an immunogen or uh, for diagnostic kits for using in ELISAs and plates. So uh, Greg Ippolito and Jason Levinder here at UT, they had COVID-19 patient sera uh, with a range of neutralizing activity. So the, the four patients are 117, M2, H2, and C2. And they performed ELISAs using either S2P or Hexapro. You can see that for each of the sera, which are colored similarly, S2P and Hexapro were, were basically identical. So the, the additional mutations didn't affect the, the antigenicity of the protein at all. Uh, indicating it should uh, work very well for diagnostics and potentially as an immunogen. So we've deposited uh, Hexapro at Agene and it's received a lot of uh, requests. We have some flame symbol. Uh, so if anybody's interested in using it or having trouble using some of the pri prior variants, uh, definitely encourage you to give this a try. We no longer use the S2P in the lab at all. Everything we do is Hexapro and different flavors of Hexapro. One thing we were curious was was whether these substitutions could be universally applied to beta coronaviruses, uh, such that if the, the next emergent COVI was like a, a MERS-like virus, could these work? And the answer is, is, is mixed. Some of them worked okay, and some of them didn't. Uh, so here I'm showing the position where two prolines were introduced. One in the fusion peptide, uh, it was originally phenylalanine, 817 and then to proline, and then we have uh, capping this helix here at this position 942. And I'm showing is the three structures for MERS CoV and like cyan, the SARS CoV 1 in pink, and SARS CoV 2 in tan. And so the fusion peptide is really similar between all three of the coronaviruses, spike proteins. And that proline substitution actually works pretty well. And so because the numbers change for MERS and SARS and SARS-CoV-1, I just indicated that position with a star. Uh, so for, for SARS-S2P, if we introduce in that fusion peptide, we see an increase in expression. So going from on uh, gel filtration, the base S2P construct to this introduction of this proline. And for MERS, we see something similar, going from S2P to the 3P containing the fusion peptide proline, we go from the dashed line to this red line. So getting about a two-fold increase. But this other proline, which worked well for SARS-CoV-2, worked okay for SARS and not at all for MERS. And we can see that the structure in this region is different. SARS-1 and SARS-2 helices in pink and tan are basically identical. Whereas MERS, the helix is tilted and it starts to unwrap a little bit earlier. And so that position isn't identical between SARS and MERS. So for, for SARS-1, the introduction of that proline uh, triangle, that increases expression very nicely. So we go from the dashed line to the purple. And if we combine them, we get a really nice increase. So we've also you know, created a, an improved SARS-CoV-1 variant containing these prolines. But for MERS, it was actually detrimental. So this purple line uh, is for that substitution. We go from the dashed S2P construct, and we actually decrease expression. And then if we combine the two, uh, they actually cancel each other out, and we get back to the, to the original. So I think this type of thing is useful for trying to understand what substitutions can be broadly applicable to, to beta coronaviruses in general, and which ones are more specific and might need a bit of scanning in that region. Uh, if we need to rapidly design stabilized spikes for a, a new coronavirus. Uh, Jason, two minutes to wrap up. Oh, okay. Actually, maybe I'll just wrap up then. Uh, yeah, this is gonna take too long. So I'll wrap up. We also isolated some antibodies from humans that cross-react with SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2, and we're working on some structures. So to summarize, our prior research on COVID spike structures allowed for the structure-based design of these two stabilizing proline mutations. The S2P substitutions are now in four of the five leading COVID vaccines. Uh, Hexapro, which contains the four additional prolines, is substantially improved. Uh, in the future, we're trying to work on you know, universal coronavirus vaccines and antibodies. How to define universal? Can you get all COVID, beta COVID, uh, lineage specific beta COVIDs like SARS like and MERS like? 
and trying to identify other epitopes, uh, particularly in S2, that have been uh, uh, difficult. Almost all the antibodies seem to be RBD and NTD directed. Uh, so I'd like to, to thank everybody in the lab, especially Nian Shuang, Daniel, Qingling, and Jory for, for leading all the, the efforts on the S2P and Hexapro. Jennifer and Ilya and their labs for contributing to the, the big effort. Greg and Jason for the ELISAs. Uh, Barney and Kizzy, who we've worked with on coronaviruses for years. Uh, Laura and Anna at Adamab, Kartik, John Dye, Ralph Baer for some of the antibody work and talked about funding. And it also turned out that Hexapro uh, name was already taken, but this is a delicious shake. And so we don't mind sharing it with this protein company. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you, Jason, for a great talk. Uh, there's been a request to go back to your antibody slides that you skipped over. Oh. Uh, and we do have a couple of minutes. Uh, okay. All right. I'll try and go through this somewhat quickly. So this was back in February when uh, it was difficult to find uh, convalescent plasma in the U.S. So that, that situation has changed. But back then, we did have access to a SARS-CoV-1 donor. And uh, blood was able to be obtained uh, from Barney Graham and sent to Laura Walker at Adamab. They used our S2 key stabilized spikes as probes to sort memory B cells. And then we're able to generate uh, several hundred monoclonal antibodies. And for each of the monoclonal antibodies that were produced, uh, neutralization was obtained based on a BSV system from Kartik or authentic virus from John Dye, affinity measurements, uh, epitope mapping, and structural studies. And so this is one donor, donor 84, obviously a survivor of the 2003 SARS outbreak. Uh, blood was drawn about 13 years post-infection. I think it was around 2016, I think around 2016. And uh, as I mentioned, so Laura sort, sorted on class-switched memory B cells using our uh, S2P spikes, and they cloned and produced 315 antibodies and tested all of them for binding to our spike protein, and 200 of them found the SARS-CoV-2 spikes. About 30% of those had a uh, convergent germline uh, gene pairing. So 30% all used BH169, BKappa 230, uh, and the other ones were, were more diverse. Two thirds were IgG, and one third came from IgA positive memory B cells. And overall about 0.14% of this person's memory B cells reacted with the SARS-CoV-2 probes uh, compared to about 0.051% uh, from a naive patient. Of the 200 monoclonal antibodies that uh, were confirmed to bind to the SARS-CoV-2 spike, 153 bound both SARS-CoV-1 uh, on this axis and SARS-CoV-2 on this axis. And these are the ones we were really interested in trying to identify these broadly, uh, how we define that, but at least SARS reactive monoclonal antibodies. Interestingly, of the other 50, uh, some were actually SARS-CoV-2 specific. So these bound SARS-CoV-2, uh, some with very high affinity and had no binding to our SARS-CoV-1 spike, which was interesting because it's a SARS-CoV-1 donor. Um, we're not sure, potentially differences between the infecting strain and the probe we were using. 30% uh, of these did end up binding to SARS-CoV-1 expressed on cells, but not our probe. So potentially some some differences, uh, maybe avidity or clustering on the cell surface. Uh, we saw, uh, this is kind of complicated to go through, but uh, most people can pay attention to affinity with higher affinity being darker purple. So we saw a nice subset, maybe 60 or so, that, that primarily bound tightly to SARS-2 and SARS-1. We had some that were primarily SARS-CoV-2 specific that didn't bind with spikes from 229E, HK1, NL63, or OC43. We were initially really excited by some of these, which appeared to be mostly pan-CoV reactive. They bound SARS-1 and SARS-2 and the alpha covies uh, But these ended up, well, they're all pretty low affinity. And maybe that makes sense. You're sacrificing specificity and affinity for breadth. Uh, but at least these were non-neutralizing when tested against SARS-2 and SARS. Um, a lot of them are S2 directed, but I think they're not the region that refolds, but the long stalk region that's often disordered uh, in our cryo-EM structures. Uh, of the 64 highest affinity antibodies, uh, Laura tested those for competition, and Kartik and John Dye tested them for neutralization. Uh, we had, uh, and for epitope mapping, maybe a third was NTD, a third was RBD directed, and a quarter were S2 directed. Of the third that were RBD directed, half competed with ACE2 and half did not. Um, 
let's see, the ones that competed with ACE2 were the most potent, which is perhaps not surprising, so really blocking that initial interaction. So here's a bunch of the antibodies. Uh, these ones in dark green competed with ACE2. Th those are also the most potent against the SARS-CoV-2 um, authentic virus neutralization assay. Uh, similarly, if we look uh, at neutralization, for those that compete with ACE2, those were really quite potent at a single 100 nanomolar concentration. The non-ACE2 uh, competing RBD-directed antibodies were, were less potent. NTD generally less potent, although there was one that, that, that looked okay. And there's now been some papers published on NTD-directed neutralizing antibodies, so those can be uh, potently neutralizing. All the S2-directed ones, um, again, I think they're mostly against the stock, and so those are non-neutralizing. But excitingly, we had three antibodies that reacted broadly with SARS-CoV-1, SARS-CoV-2, and even WIV-1. Uh, this is a, a bat SARS-like coronavirus that Ralph Barrick has published on and others. Uh, it has yet to emerge into humans, but this also, this, these antibodies are also capable of neutralizing those. And uh, we have some initial uh, kind of low-res negative stenium showing that the antibodies are coming in at different angles, uh, really quite different angles, different stoichiometries, and now we're working on some high resolution studies and Adamab is uh, affinity maturing these and really trying to generate at least a uh, SARS pan-reactive monoclonal antibody and seeing maybe if we can extend it to other beta coronaviruses, but if not, maybe we could at least develop four distinct corona, uh, antibodies that, that broadly neutralize each of the four lineages in the, the beta coronavirus test. Okay, 